The part of the brain that becomes active when you've been fallen madly in love with somebody is in the most primitive part of the brain, where all survival mechanisms are thirst, hunger, and romantic love. Just 50 years ago, 70% of the adult population in the U.S. was married. Today, that number has dropped to 31%. Love isn't gone, it's simply changing. How we find it, how we define it, and the ways we express it. What is at the heart of this evolution in love? And how are things like data and technology making love better than ever? I'm Cara Santa Maria, a science journalist exploring the technologies of today, tomorrow, and beyond. On this episode of Invention Factory, how will love be deeper? Finding insight in something as boundless as love is difficult to do. In the past, our understanding came from our friends, family, and personal experience. Today, data is everywhere and in everything. And by analyzing it, we can find patterns in the chaos. You can have like a million people in a room. They start looking the same, but it takes something small to trigger an interaction or relationship. It's hard to quantify, it's hard to find. It's hard to even know what it is. It's hard to know what it is. So you have to define that. What our field tries to do is to look for those exceptions. Heartbeat patterns, breathing patterns, anything. We have the ability to capture all that data and see if there's anything in there that's unusual. What are these patterns showing us? And how is the way we love actually changing? To find out, I went and spoke with biological anthropologist Helen Fisher. Hi, oh. Helen. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Come on in. Technology is definitely improving our lives. And it's improving love because it's enabling us to pick from a wider pool, mm. from a wider age group, more interests, and in your pajamas at midnight. The brain circuitry for love has not changed in probably the last 4.4 million years. But how we express love changes all the time. We seem to think this big turnover in relationships is something modern, something new. For 10,000 years, you really had to marry for life. But if you go back farther into our hunting and gathering past, women had all kinds of affairs. So basically, I think we're moving forward to the kinds of relationships that we had for millions of years. And technology is helping that. Now we have these whole networks on the internet that we can tap into and find love. So these questions come from our database of questions, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and the way it picks which question to ask you next is um, which question sort of divides the user base a lot. So you want something that's almost polarizing in a way? Exactly. We started OkCupid in 2003. And me and the other three founders, we were all math majors, so we're kind of naturally analytic people. And given the robustness of big data, you know, we're dealing with millions and millions of people. You know, seven million people today will exchange messages. And so we, we know it's very uniform and very, very um, cut and dried across all the data. The uniformity of the trends, that can be surprising. Like guys like younger women, women judge men much more harshly than men judge them. The average woman on OkCupid gets about three stars on a one to five scale. It makes sense, it's right in the middle. An average guy gets two stars. We certainly know that there's patterns. There's patterns to culture, there's patterns to nature, there's patterns to personality, and there's patterns to who you love. With human behavior, people have come with those macroscopic measures because they can't look at the microscopic. So because of these kind of data analytics, are we any closer to understanding human behavior? Certain types of it, for sure, yeah. But this idea that people are ever going to, like, come up with a love algorithm or something, there's, there's no way a computer will ever be able to absorb that, um, I don't think. So I've been in this field since I was an undergrad. I've actually been modeling on one of the largest supercomputers in the world. And what I'm really trying to look for is how water transforms into ice. I think that as computing gets better, it'll get closer to real life, closer to nature and you can actually start modeling the things that people care about. Let's say that I had a droplet of water, mm -hmm. it has a million water molecules in it, and three of them moved ever so slightly, less than a nanometer. That is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Only with a needle in a haystack, I can take a magnet and pull out the needle. This is really more like looking at a needle in a stack of needles, yeah. because all the molecules are identical, and just a couple of them moved ever so slightly, and that's what we're trying to track. Could you date someone who is really quiet? 
Yes, please. All right. Do you often make jokes that offend more uptight people? All the time. <laughs> Do you believe morality is universal or relative? I think morality is universal. There will always be the situation where you see someone, uh, they have a great picture, they like all the same stuff, and then you sit down, and then you have to decide the chemistry or the attraction part at that point. You know, you can walk into a room and everybody's from your background and same level of intelligence and same level of good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. In what looks essentially the same, where are the nuggets of information that are really the teeniest, tiniest very, anomalies? Very tiny anomaly. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just water. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just people. But then there's those really rare events that happen that we're trying to detect. 